get started. Father, thank you so much, uh, Jesus, for coming into our lives and showing us who you are, Lord, that we can gather together and uh, hear more of you, Lord, to be astonished, Lord, at your word, and uh, just to be instructed, Father, by you is a blessing. And thank you, Lord, that when we are all together, Lord, you'll continue to show us great things. You'll continue to uh, just impress us, and, and there'll be nothing but wows and awes, Lord, coming from us, and, and just worship from our hearts, Lord, onto you. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to uh, just show us your word, Lord, to open up our ears to hear your word, and uh, we love you, Father. We invite you into this place, and we pray that you would uh, just have your way with us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, we're going to start from verse 12. I wanted to go all the way to verse 20 to end the chapter today, but I realized the first teaching this morning that uh, we're, there's no, not enough time. So we're going to just chop it up and do the first section. The next section we'll do uh, next week, Lord willing. But, um, but see, that's what I like. We're doing six verses, and there's not enough time to do more. And yeah. Like, that's awesome, you know? It's because there's so much in here. Yeah. But, so last week, uh, we were talking about false teachers. There's a lot of false teachers out there, and these guys were teaching the law. They're teaching all kinds of stuff. And we, we talked about um, our, our position as Christians, and we, I mentioned the word sanctification, and I wanted to throw that out there, is making sure that we all understand our position as believers, as Christians, when we first came to the cross, right? When we realized that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that his bloodshed was enough. It was sufficient for us, right? We repented of our sins. We came at the throne of God in that sense, right? And we, we said, Lord, here I am. You know, use me. You know, I surrender my life. And Jesus, he, we say that. It's a terminology, right? That he came into our hearts and now he's living and abiding in our lives, right? In our hearts. And so we were saved. And a big word for that is sanctification, right? We were justified, if you will. All, there's so many things that happened all at that moment when we came to the Lord, when we uh, gave our lives to Jesus. And so positionally, before God, before the throne of God, we are, we're perfect in his eyes. Why? Because we are washed by His blood, we are we're made we were made righteous. What does that word mean? We were made as if we have never sinned before. We were spotless at that moment of salvation. Why? Because we're covered by His blood, and so we are we're washed, right? We're we're, we're made perfect in His eyes, but obviously practically right now, are we perfect? Mm. No, right? Yet. right? Maybe my wife is. Huh? <laughs> you see, we we we're still we're currently growing. We're maturing. Why? Because we fall. We we walk and we fall and make mistakes. And we 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 constantly come to the Lord and we're like, Lord, I didn't mean to do that, but I really did. I'm sorry. And I I'm choosing not to go that route anymore. Right? We're holding our thoughts captive. We're we're doing a lot of things as to not go the way of the world or the way of our flesh, right? Like the enemy tempts us. So we're currently uh, growing and going through those things. So remember chapter 1, by the way, is it's by way of contrast. In other words, Paul, he's, we, we talked about false teachers, right? From verse 3 all the way to verse 12. Now in verses, uh, well, verse 11, now verse 12 through... 20 to the end of the chapter, he's going to contrast from false teachers to now to true teachers. And he's going to give himself as an illustration for us of who a true teacher is. And so last week we saw in verse 3 to 12 dealing with the false teachers, and we talked about really three things dealing with false teachers. The number one was the command to false teachers, number two is the character of false teachers. Number three, we saw the concern for false teachers. And the command to the false teachers was simply to knock it off, right? <laughs> stop it. Stop teaching falsely, right? Paul said stop. The reason behind this command was in love, right? It was because of love's sake that you don't go and deceive 
the people of the church and, and lead them astray as you are being led astray. That's why you're giving a false teaching. So Paul loved, he loved the church of Ephesus, right? This is the church where Timothy, the book that we're in right now, Timothy was a young pastor. He was a pastor here in Ephesus. Paul loved them, right? He loved all, he loved all the people. And we saw also the character of the false teachers. One thing that characterizes false teachers is that they stray from the Word of God, obviously, right? You can turn on the TV and there's certain false teachers who are there and, and they just, they, they talk and talk and talk. And, and maybe they even hold the Bible, but you never see that Bible open, right? You never hear the Bible coming out of them. And so they go off into all kinds of different teachings and all different places, but they also teach... Uh, according to 1 Timothy, the law of God. So they're bringing back the law of God and while they're straying from the word of God. And they were teaching law and not grace. They were pulling away from the liberty and the freedom uh, the, of God's grace into a heavy load of do's and don'ts. And remember, how many commandments are in Exodus chapter 20? When Moses came down the mountain, right? He had the, the stones. Yeah. He had... Ten Commandments! Hey, good morning, guys. Ten Commandments! Pop quiz. Who broke all the commandments all at once? Moses. Ah, I'm just joking. Anyways, so, but did you know that there's more than ten commandments in the Bible? How much? In the Old Testament alone. 613. 613 commandments alone. So you try doing that. All the do's and don'ts. That's what these false teachers are doing. They're creeping into the church of Ephesus. Paul knows about it. Paul's writing this letter to Timothy and saying, hey, warn these false teachers to stop it, right? Stop it. Don't be doing these things and what they're doing. And what they're doing is bringing the law instead of bringing the... Why were you, you were saved by Jesus to continue following the law? And Paul makes it very clear that that doesn't make sense. And so he brings up the Word of God in other letters and showing them the difference of why we don't live according to the law but according to grace. And so the third thing about false teachers is that they don't understand. And we talked all about this last week, right? They didn't understand what the law was all about, that the law was good, it was just, it was holy, it was perfect. And, but the law was never given to us to make us righteous. That, that's not the point. The law, the purpose of the law is to show us that we are not righteous, right? Paul talked about I wouldn't know that I, I, I was about covetousness unless the Bible said, or the law said, that thou shall not covet. Oh, look, I shouldn't covet. Why? How do I know that? Because the Bible, the, the law says it. So the law is there. But by the way, the Bible says that the strength of the law is sin. Did you know that? Without sin, there's no purpose of even having the law. And that makes sense in our society today. If everybody was nice and perfect and orderly, there would be no need for the law. There would be no need for a motor vehicle, right? <laughs> right? All this stuff. It's, it's the same thing. So, the law. That's what the law does. There, we also talked about the concern for these false teachers. And obviously, Paul was very concerned for these false teachers, right? It wasn't, he didn't have the attitude of, oh, let them just, you know, let them burn, you know? Let them not go to heaven. Let them, you know... That wasn't his attitude. His attitude was more of the restoration side, right? Here, warn them because they're heading in a bad direction, right? Warn them because I care for them, them the, the, themselves individually. So, very interesting. So, But today we're going to see that contrast from these false teachers now to the true teachers, right? When we're talking about false teachers, some of you guys might be like, oh, 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 oh right? But now it's like, ah, oh, true teacher. And oh, now when we're reading, we can just be like, oh, this is great. So Paul's going to illustrate really that the true teacher, uh, speaking of himself here, look at, let's just read. Verse 12, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul says. However, verse 16, 
For this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be, uh, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Mm. And he goes on. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected, concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they might learn not to blasphemy. So, man, <laughs> this is jam-packed right here. Uh, what a great example that is, though, to have the example of Paul himself of uh, being a true teacher for us, a true example, right? Paul wrote about one-third of the New Testament, obviously, uh, besides the, the, the Gospels. Uh, he was obviously a teacher at heart, right? He loved to teach. Uh, his instructor was a great teacher in all of history, really. You look back at the great teachers, he was one of the greats uh, in the world, you can say, right? Gamaliel. Uh, but today we're going to break our text up in two different sections. Um, and like I said earlier, I don't think we'll get to the second section. But the first, we're going to be dealing with the true teachers um, and, and, and speaking about Paul and, and why he's thankful. He's going to give us some reasons why he is thankful as a true teacher. Now, a true teacher, uh, number one, like Paul, he's thankful. And it's illustrated for us in verse 12. Look at verse 12 again. And I thank God. Christ Jesus our Lord. So notice a true teacher opposed to obviously a phony teacher, right? A false teacher. Um, he's going to be thankful unto Jesus Christ. Now, how do I know, right? How do I know that this teacher is true and that teacher is false? And how do I know the difference? One area that you can know of, according to the Bible and what the Bible says right here, is that a quality, a characteristic about them is that they're always going to be thankful. You're going to be around them and they're going to be always like, man, I'm so grateful that, oh, I'm thankful. I'm, they recognize their position, thus that's how they are thankful. Now, there's other teachers who are a quality or characteristic about them that may be always complaining. And always, they're, 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 it's never enough, right? Like always grumbling and murmuring and, oh, why don't you do this? Oh, 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 oh this person did that to me. I just can't believe it. And, oh, can you believe they gave me this? Oh, I deserve this. Da, 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 da. There's just an ungratefulness in their heart. They're not thankful. Paul is a true teacher and he was thankful, right? And so because he realizes it's all about Jesus Christ, right? That's why he could be thankful. So the false teachers, they were turning away from God's word and God himself, and they were turning toward what they felt or what they thought, or, and we'll get into it later on too. They got into this system, this way of thinking called Gnosticism, right? It was like a whole other doctrine, and they started throwing that stuff out. But they were t turning toward strange doctrines. They're turning toward false teaching, endless genealogies, uh, and we're seeing this evident today, obviously. You can, you can watch, uh, you know, there are many teachers, and they just go off on stuff that doesn't make sense, because they themselves don't even realize what they're even saying. They're just saying it, and just it's just weird. And that's what's happening here in the Church of Ephesus. There's people coming into the pulpit, and they're going jibba-jabba-jibba-jabba, right? And, it's, and that's all it is. And there's no meaning behind it. And, and that's the difference in the world. The world, it's, it's like they give uh, encouragement to each other that's meaningless. And the other person that's the, of the world, they love it because they don't know anything more than meaningless, right? Here's some advice for you. Blah. Oh, I love it. What does it mean? I don't know. I'm going to go and do it, though. Right? As believers, we know the truth, we're confident in the truth, and we can examine the truth, and we look back at the truth, and there's nothing, right, that everything has a point to it and what we do. There's a motive behind it, right? There's an attitude behind it. So true teachers, we're, we're thankful onto Jesus Christ because of Jesus Christ, right? He, it's all about him. The focus is all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. So it's not about hype and excitement and and lights and cameras and glares and the latest, greatest laser 
in the church and the fog machine and the you know the rock concert worship and uh, all that great stuff. And now, by the way, they have the flat screens on their the back of their chairs. Wow, we got to get that for our church. Wow, we can see his nostrils. Wow, you know? is that? Huh? there's there's it's a lot of churches are doing that now. Believe it or not, a lot of the big ones, mega churches. I I get these weird. I don't know why I get them, but they're uh, they're they're advertisement for like all this sound equipment and all this everything's like over a hundred thousand dollars but they're like the latest tvs in your chair wow <laughs> i was like no so but anyways uh but that that's that's not what it's all about right it's all about who it's all about jesus christ it's not about programs it's about the power of jesus christ in and through our lives right and the work that he can do through us, right? We need to stick to Jesus by sticking to the, what the Bible says, right? Because we know what the Bible says about Jesus is true. It's been proven. It's been tested. So Paul was thankful to Jesus in eight ways, right? Eight reasons, I could say, why the true teacher, Paul, in this sense right here, right, was so thankful unto Jesus Christ. Number one, because Christ enabled him. Look at verse 12 again. Notice in the middle, it says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. Right? Our enablement, our empowerment, it comes by Jesus Christ himself. And no other and nothing else. Right? True power, true enablement um, comes by the power and the person and the presence of Jesus Christ himself. Right? Working in every single believer in the church. So, Turn with me to Philippians, by the way. This is, I'm going to get you guys turning. Uh, probably five, six, seven pages to your left. Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. And while you're turning there, you, you see, whenever Christ calls you, he's always going to enable you to serve him. Right? Our strength, our power, it's not through what these new books and these new videos and instructions say about how to be an effective leader or how to, you know, to be, you know, powerful and dynamic and it's not about all that, right? To me, all that is, it's called junk. <laughs> it's, it's great advice, it's wonderful, but as far as being a Christian and the way the function of the church goes, all of that is meaningless because it's without power. True power, true enablement comes through who? Jesus. That's right. Jesus Christ himself. So Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 13. Philippians 4, 13. It says, I can do most. Oh, does it say I can do most things? No. I can do Mine says all. all things. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can do all. What a difference that is, mm. right? I can do all things through Christ uh, who strengthens me. So who enables us to do all things? Christ. Christ Jesus. So we think the more that we can do, the, the better that we become in the church. That's the mindset of a lot of people in a lot of churches, is, man, the more I do, the more I become. That's true. Huh? Yeah, the more I do. The more church I attend, the more service I give, the more tithing I do, the more whatever, right? You guys get the point? The more I do, the more somehow it's going to make me more effective and more powerful at what I do, right? And, and that's true in sales, that's true in marketing, that's true in, you know, in, in hobbies and sports and performance, right? You got the more you practice, the more you better you become, but spiritually in the church, that's a, uh, 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 that's a no way, get out of there. Don't even bring that worldliness into the church. The only way you and I can become and do anything unto the Lord is simply by His grace, and it's through His enablement, right? So, it's, and by the way, all of those that I just said, the more things that you do, those are all byproducts, by the way, of the enablement that God gives you, right? The moment you became saved, and you're a Christian now, you're walking with the Lord, He enables you, He empowers you, now the byproduct, the natural things I should say that come after that are you're gonna want to church more, give more, serve more, do all those things, right? Mm -hmm. You but it's not a I have to, I gotta, I do, you know? It's yeah and that's the difference, right? So turn with me now to Ephesians six. Ephesians six um, should be to what your right? To your left. To your left, like one page or two page. 
Or right here, Ephesians 6, 10. It says, finally, and obviously it's not final. He's going to keep going on like a great preacher, right? Mm -hmm. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of your own might. Mm -hmm. Right? That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? Yeah. Be strong in the power of your might. No. Right. No? What does it say? His might. His might. Oh, man. That just ruined psychologists. <laughs> our strength, our power comes from... Him, that's right, it comes from the Lord. So from, from Him, through Him, because of Him, it's all from Jesus Christ. It, it's all G he, it's Jesus, right? So by the way, we're called into the ministry in ministering, right? As believers, we're to minister unto other people. Um, but don't live your life like it depends on you. Don't, and I, I'm afraid that that's a lot of people in the church. They live their life like it's all about them and their decisions and how their decisions are going to work out in the end and what's going to happen. And oh no, if I don't do this, God's going to be all sad and he's, oh, and he's not going to accomplish his will in the church and everyone's going to look at me because I failed and blah, blah, blah. But like somehow you have, you know, the, the, you have to rely on your inner strength. Lie down, close your eyes, and find the power within you. That's what the world says, as if. There's power within you. Oh, I, I see it. There it is. Okay, now you just got to release it. You guys know what I'm saying? The world gives some weird advice. And people who are the world, they don't even understand that advice, but they'll take it. They'll be like, yeah, I, got, I can do it. <laughs> it's all about me. That's, that's, that's psychology, right? Psych, psychiatrists will give you all that. But we know that that is dumb. <laughs> The power is Jesus Christ. It's through Christ Jesus. Never turn to anything, anybody else. Zechariah 4.6 uh, clearly states, not by might, not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Not you. God's not looking at you because you're great and wonderful and powerful and anything that... He's looking at you because you're not any of those things. And He knows He can glorify you because of that. Because you... And humble yourself and say, I can't. That's worship, by the way, unto the Lord. That, amen. If you, if that's your attitude. So never rely on yourself in anything, right? On your own sufficiency, on your own dependency, right? Because uh, being to we were to be totally dependent upon Jesus Christ, and that, that's where our sufficiency comes from. The Bible says, and uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think of anything as the from being from ourselves. But our sufficiency is from who? God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, speaking of the Old Testament, the law, right? But, but the spirit gives life. So Paul was thankful for sure that Christ enabled him. Now, another area, Paul was thankful to Jesus Christ because because Jesus Christ counted him faithful. Look at verse 12 in the middle, right? Who has enabled me because he counted me faithful. Notice that. Was it because he was so wonderful that Christ Jesus counted him faithful? No, it wasn't. But was it because he can speak perfectly? No. Was it because he had more knowledge that exceeded everybody else? No, right? It, of course not. We're going to see uh, that Paul was a, a blasphemer. He was a, 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 a persecutor. He was the chief of sinners. Why did Christ count Paul faithful? Because Christ, Christ was looking, he was counting his own faithfulness within Paul. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little tricky, doesn't it? But you and I are not counted faithful because of our faithfulness. Amen? Amen. All right. I thought about this when I was studying through here. I was like, oh, Lord, I'm so thankful that you don't count me faithful based on my own faithfulness. I will be rotting in hell if that was the case. <laughs> ah, I never made it because I'm, I'm not faithful. I don't know about you guys. I'm pretty sure you guys are not. I'm not faithful uh, by, by no means, right? In and of myself, in my own flesh. Praise the Lord that God doesn't count you faithful according to your works and who you are, right? So it, it's, a, it's based on Christ's faithfulness. And we're, we're kind of faithful, by the way, because of... Christ and His faithfulness we rely upon, right? And it's His faithfulness that helps us in anything, right? I'm faithful, so it, our faithfulness, I should just say this, our faithfulness cannot get us into the kingdom of God, okay? Pretty simple.
But our faithfulness is his faithfulness. Turn with me to 1 John. 1 John is like, I don't know, near the end. Close to Revelation, and then go to the left, and you got Jude. 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. I want you guys to understand this, and I want you guys to see this. So I'm going to wait till we all get there. 1 John chapter 5. And look at... If you haven't turned there yet, you can just look up there. But 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who is faithful in himself? He who has power within himself? He who can do all things according to himself? Is that true? No, it says, but who is he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's the overcomer who overcomes this world. If you believe on Jesus Christ, and that's taking us back to our salvation in Christ. When we first came to Jesus, we believe that he is Jesus Christ, right? He's God Almighty come in the flesh. And so if you believe that simple thing about him, you already, that's, that's, psh, there it is. So if you put your faith in Christ Jesus, believe on him, right? And then if this is you, if you're the church who believes on Jesus Christ and, and God's been doing a work in your life, there's a reward for you. Check this out. I did a little treasure hunt here and I found a little treasure road in a sense in the Bible here that nobody else has found. I'm just joking. Everybody knows about this if you search for yourself. But um, 1 John, if you're still there, look at chapter 2. Look at verse 13. I want to show you guys your reward if you are a overcomer. Okay, 1 John chapter 2, look at verse 13. It says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And I write to you little children because you have known the father. But notice those who have overcome, you, they've overcome the wicked one, specifically here in the context uh, speaking to the young men. But notice in 1 John 4, go over to chapter 4, look at verse 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So you're an overcomer over the enemy himself. Go over to Revelation. Revelation, probably like three pages to the right. Revelation chapter 2, and look at verse 7. Revelation 2, verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this is great. If you're an overcomer, you get to eat from the tree of life. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. So skip down to verse 17. He who has an ear, there you go. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. False teachers will say, No, I know it now. This is just joking. Okay, Revelation, look at chapter 2, verse 26. Skip down to verse 26. It says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. You get to eat from the tree of life. You get to eat manna from heaven, have a new name. You get to be overcoming from the wicked one. Now you have power over the nations. This is crazy. Look at chapter 3. Skip down to chapter 3, verse 5. Chapter 3, verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Look at verse 12 of chapter 3. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the, name, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven, from my God, and I'll write on him my new name, Jesus says. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me 
on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This, that, right? Imagine just in the kingdom of God and coming up to the throne of God and sitting down next to him. Hey, God, how's it going? Andrew? Angels are like, oh, did he just sit on the throne? <laughs> we can't do that. But as overcomers, as believers in Christ, we have access even to the throne of God to sit with him. Look at Revelation chapter 12. It goes on. I know, right? Look at chapter 12, verse 11. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. This is crazy. So those who are overcomers are those who are covered by the blood of the Lamb. What is that all talking about? When Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and I, when you chose to confess your sins, Romans 10, 9, 1 John 1, 9, right? You chose to confess your sins. Often you repented of your sins. You said, I see my sin, but I don't want it anymore. I'm going completely the opposite direction. And you gave the Lord your life in that sense, right? You said, Lord, my life is yours. You died to yourself at that moment, and you begin to take up the cross of Christ in that sense, right? You begin to live the life that God has called you to live. Now, I'm not saying that you're perfect all of a sudden, right? But, but you became a new creation, right? And we fall, but we, we, get, we give our hearts back to the Lord. Look at Revelation 21. This is the last one here on this little trail. Revelation 21, verse 7. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. What a promise from God himself to the overcomers, to those who are with him. Now, go back with me to 1 Timothy. That was a cool little, little, little gold nugget for you guys. Um, the third reason why Paul was thankful, and we're just going to go over eight, eight ways or reasons why Paul was thankful today. But the third reason Paul was thankful is because Christ put him into the ministry. Look at verse 12 again at the end. It says, he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Right? Paul realized Christ put him into the ministry. And where did Christ, when did this happen? Do you guys know this? Acts chapter 9, on the road to... Damascus. Damascus, right? The light shone around him. He was like, wow, what's going on? He was going with the mission. He was a very religious man, by the way, right? Little side note about Paul. His name was Saul before it was Paul, right? And Saul, he thought he was glorifying God. He thought he was honoring the Lord, and he's on this way. He's, he's, he's a, he, I, I believe in God. I love God. I know the scripture. And, and in fact, those above me who are in leadership, they all acknowledge that I love God and that I'm basically going to go to heaven. And he's on his way. He's got permission by them to go. And what is he doing on this road? Where is he going? He's going to go persecute Christians. He's going to kill Christians, right? He's going to go kill people. And then, soon to find out, he's on his way, and he's been persecuting Jesus Christ himself. All of the, He didn't even know that he was against Christ. The whole time his motive in his heart was, I'm for God, I love God, I'm worshiping God by singing the song to God, you know, things are great. And all the while, he was against God. Isn't that crazy? He thought he was delighting God's heart, and the whole time he was breaking God's heart. And that's, I, I, I'm sad to say, there's a lot of people in ministry today in the church. Is they're going about their business, doing what they're doing in the church, serving and giving and, and praising and worshiping and, oh, I give and I'm doing, look at me. And the whole time, they probably don't even know Jesus. They probably never even experienced the Lord in their life. And yet they're just living a religious life because they're good, a good person. But they, they, they don't know what it means to hear from God. They just know the terminology. Yeah, I love to hear from God. Oh, well, yeah, have you heard from God? Of course I have. But they don't really know that you can actually hear from God. That God's Word is the same from yesterday, today, and forever. As you read the Word of God, it really it's, it comes alive to you, doesn't it? It speaks to your heart. He leads us and guides us and directs us in the ways that we should go. So the third reason that Paul was thankful unto Jesus is because he put him into the ministry. It was Jesus who put him into ministry. By the way, people put themselves into ministry. Did you guys know that? They, they want ministry so bad. They want position so bad. They'll go out there and they'll just 
break doors open. Oh, look, an open door. <laughs> right? No, they'll, they'll go do their thing. But they try marketing and sales and they bring all this stuff from the world into the church and they think, oh, because we got people in our church, somehow we're, we're, we're doing, you know, we're pleasing God because look at the numbers, God. God's not into numbers. He's into hearts. Mm. You can have millions yeah. of people in the church and only one person with that heart for the Lord. And it's a scary thing, but it's true, right? So remember, we all have opportunities to minister, by the way. Wherever you are, that's where God's called you to serve at, right? Whether it's at work, whether it's at home, whether it's wherever you are. You are who you are, not just when you're at church. Oh, I'm just a deacon when I'm at church only because I'm a pastor uh, only for this time, <laughs> right? No, what? Doesn't make sense at all. You need to be who you are every single day of the day <laughs> and of the week. So dealing with the church, by the way, corporately, um, I think that we need to step out a little more. If you don't understand where God's called you, what place that you should be in the church, because we all function as the church, right? In different areas of the church. I think there's a lot of people that are just sitting down and they don't know, they don't, they don't, and, I, and this is more of my thoughts that are right here. I was thinking about this and I was listening to some worship music and I was thinking of the, the person singing and how beautiful the, the sounds were and how, you know, they're glorifying God and they're worshiping the Lord. But where did that all start? They had to step out some point in faith. Right? And, and step out and they, they, they say, hey, I'm just going to worship God. And they start when everybody's like, whoa, and they start worshiping God. And you know what I mean? There's a lot of ministries, but I think we rob ourselves by not stepping out into, into faith. If you don't know where you're called, you don't know, you know where the Lord's called you in that specific area, step out. The least that's going to happen is this. You're going to step out and you're going to be doing your thing and it's going to be stressful and it's going to be a work and it's going to be, oh, I got to go do this today. Oh, I got to, oh, and you're going to be clanging symbols and people are going to be like, hey, they're going to confirm it to you. Could you just stop? <laughs> Please stop. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> maybe you're called to another direction, another place. And, and, you know, and maybe that's the case. And then just go and set, do something else. You know, that's the least. But God, God, he'll speak to you. But if you don't want to listen to him, then just, you know what I mean? Just go do it. And, and you'll find out soon enough. But I mean, when you're serving the Lord and God's put you in the place that you're sh you should be, it's going to be a joy to you. It's going to be amazing. Everything's just going to flow. And it's going to be wonderful, right? So the doors are going to open. People are going to confirm it to you. They're going to realize the gifts and the offices that God's given you. And it's just going to just going to happen naturally. It's just going to be there. And you're going to find a worship service really in your heart before mm. the Lord while you're doing that, right? It's just, it's true. You know, when you're doing what God's called you to do, it's just like, I love the Lord. There's no other motive, nothing in this world that can compare to it. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth reason Paul was thankful is because Christ had had mercy on him. Look at verse 13. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, mercy is having held back that which we deserve, right? Speaking of like judgment, you know, I, I deserve judgment. I deserve Hell, fire, brimstone, death. I deserve all of that, right? But in God's mercy, he's not giving me what I deserve. He's holding it back. Because of Paul's actions in verse 13, right? And who he used to be. This is Remember, he's giving us his testimony here. He was a blasphemer. And since he denied the deity of Christ, and he affected a lot of people's lives as well in unbelief and choosing not to accept Christ as the Savior. So he was a persecutor. He used his own physical power to go and destroy the church, right? And he had murderous threats going out to a lot of believers in Acts chapter 9. He persecuted the church at uh, 1 Corinthians 15. You can read about that. Then he realized he was laying hands on Jesus Christ himself when the Lord appeared to him in Acts chapter 9. And then all of a sudden he was just, boom, whoa, I've been against you this whole time. I am not a believer. <laughs> I thought I was. I deceived myself. And he was, he was there, by the way, consenting to the stoning of Stephen, the very first martyr in the Bible. Guess who was standing right there and saying, go ahead, throw as hard as you can. 
killed the first martyr for Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8, you can read about that. But Paul, he obviously, he deserved judgment, obviously, right? He looks at his testimony here. But the mercy of God was obtained by Paul because of what he did. This is crazy. It was, it was, it was, done, it was done through ignorance and unbelief in the things that he did. He admits it right here. Unbelief because he, he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was the Christ, was the Messiah. And ignorance because he thought what he was doing was actually right. But he was ignorant to the truth and to the fact of what the Word says. But he was persecuting the way, the Christians, right, at that time. So, but he obtained mercy. And that speaks of forgiveness, mercy, having held back that which we deserve, right? What a picture that is of Jesus Christ himself. You guys remember the words of Jesus when he was being nailed to the cross in Luke? He's in Luke 23, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They were ignorant to the fact of what they were actually doing. They didn't know literally that he was the Christ. He was the Messiah, right? So no matter how bad we were in our past or the things that we did, God is able to forgive all of those things. Isn't that great? All of the things that we've done, He's able to forgive those things. And in fact, in Psalm 103, 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed our transgressions from us. I'm thankful that He says east to west because they never meet, right? They're just... <laughs> they'll never come back. So thankful for the Lord for that. But mm -hmm. not only does God forgive, right? And but look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17 says, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Mm. This forgiveness only comes by the blood shed on the cross, right? The blood of the pure, spotless lamb. We are not only forgiven, does Christ do it with it, that sin? He, he not only forgives it, but he forgets about it. That's great. The fifth reason Paul was thankful for is because Christ gave grace to him. Look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. Mercy, okay, having held back that which we deserve. Speaking of like judgment, right? But grace is giving us what we don't deserve. It's, it's unmerited favor, right? It's a gift. Grace is... Well, it's mentioned 156 times in the New Testament. Um, we don't deserve eternal life with Christ, right? We can't work at it. We can't strive for it. There's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to obtain everlasting life with Christ. Nothing that we can do in and of ourselves, right? The only way that I am saved is by grace by grace that we are saved. Here Paul talks about the exceedingly abundant grace of God specifically. And in John chapter 1 verse 16, it says, And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. In other words, grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. Uh, it's amazing. I think we, we understand God's grace for eternal life, right? Okay, yes, I, I know that God's given me his grace and that's the only way I can enter into the kingdom of God because of his grace that he's granted to us. It's a free gift, by the way. But I, I think that a lot of us forget God's grace in our everyday life, the day-to-day, -day, the circumstances that we come to. You know, our eternal life, boom, full assurance, God, I'm confident in you, I'm going to heaven, that's great. But this little thing that just happened, whoa, what is this? And we think that somehow we can, we don't even pray for God's grace in those areas. Isn't that amazing? When we know God's grace works for our salvation eternally, we don't even rely on His grace in these temporal little things. It's amazing. So we're saved by grace. We know that, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, obviously you can't do it anything in and of yourselves, the Bible says, but it is the gift of God, not of works, right? You can't go door to door or give so many tracts or do so many push-ups, or you guys get the point, right? There's nothing you can do in and of yourself physically, but lest anyone should boast, because what would happen if you could do that? What if you can reach a certain limit of salvation by your own works, by your own merit, then you don't need God's grace. He died in vain on the cross. In fact, you made it to achievement mode, right? And now you get to the kingdom of God. Open those doors. Woo! -hoo -hoo! Hey, 
hey, how'd you get here? Well, because I reached this mode for myself. I did. Do, 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 do. But guess who the spotlight's on at that time? It's not on Jesus. And what's heaven for? What's the kingdom of God for? Who's it all for? It's all for Jesus. It's not for you. But trip out, God has made us. It's the marriage, right? We're the bridegroom of Christ. We, we, we're the bride. So we, sorry. <laughs> we, we're, we're together. It's just, oh, we, uh, whatever. Romans 3, 24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so I, I think, I think we understand salvation, okay? I think we understand grace for salvation. But I think we forget that we need God's grace every day of every moment of our lives, right? We start to live according to our own power and our own might and our own flesh, and, 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 and His grace saves us, but we got to realize that His grace also sustains us in our everyday life, right? We need to rely on His grace. Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, So now, brethren, I command you, commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able, what is His grace able to do? Let's find out. It's able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So we are not built up by who we are or what we do or anything about us. We're built up simply by His grace. Amen. And how much is His grace? Twenty dollars. That's it, all right? Sufficient. How much is it? It's all sufficient. All His grace is free for mm -hmm. you and I. Mm -hmm. But how much was it for Him? Everything. He gave His everything. He it, it counted Him His entire life. He died in our exchange because we deserve that death on the cross. But He took our place that we now we it's handed to us for free. And guess how stubborn and prideful we are. Oh, God's grace, God's sufficiency. Oh, believe on Him, put my faith in Him. I don't think so. I'm going this way. We volunteer to not go to heaven. Where are we going to go if we're not going to heaven? Right? And that's, uh, we volunteer. We, we're not destined for that, but we want to go on our own. Romans 5, uh, 1 5 says, Through Him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name. So we can be obedient only through the grace of Jesus Christ, right? We in and of ourselves cannot obey God, okay? Just picture it. Okay, I'm going to give you a little, I don't even know if this is right, but you're in the throne room of God, right? There's that throne again. And, and God's speaking to all the angelic host, and everybody, who will go for me? And you're like, I'll go. Look at me. I'll go. Here I am. Woo, send me. Uh, I'm on my way. I'm going to go and please God. I'm going to be obedient to him right now. Well, you better grab some grace, because without grace in your life, you cannot please God. You can't even obey him. What does that mean? You'll never reach that level of obedience. You'll never satisfy Him. He'll never be happy with you because you chose not to receive His grace. But as believers, we have His grace. This is crazy. So Romans 5.2 says, Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So the only way we can be bold and stand for Jesus Christ, you know when you guys are talking to the world and you're like, hey, can I show you guys a Bible verse? Can I, can I share with you something about Christianity, about the Bible? And you're like, oh, can I please? Oh, no, okay. Right? The only way you can actually stand and be bold is by the grace of God. Give me your grace right now, right? That's the only way you can do it. And it's by His grace. In Romans chapter uh, 5, what is it? Oh, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians 4.15, it says, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause, what does grace do in our lives? What does it cause? It causes thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. So the only way we can thank God in the midst of, and I'm talking about, okay, let's say you just won the Powerball. Is it easy to thank God for that? Of course it is. You just got a new job with a great raise. Is it, is it easy to thank God for that? But let's say you just got... Uh, cancer. Let's just say somebody in the family just died that you love. Let's just say, you guys get the point? Is it easy now to thank God for that? No! Can you thank God truly out of your own flesh and your own might in that area? No! You need God's grace, and God's grace is sufficient to thank Him in any circumstance. And you can be grateful unto the Lord and thankful 
unto the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll see this later on, in verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So our strength is by grace, right? Remember, grace means it's a free gift, right? So there's actually a whole bunch more on grace. I just handpicked a couple of them, but you guys could do your own study. Turn with me to Titus. If you're at 1 Timothy, go a couple pages to your right. There's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. The only way to be to overcome lust in your life, the only way to be godly in your life, right? Have you ever thought about that? I really want to be godly. How do I do it? Oh, I really want to overcome this lust and this passion and this desire in this area. How can I do it? I'm lost. What page? Titus chapter 2. Um, I don't know what page it is in that Okay, well, that's how I met. Um, Titus chapter 2. It's going to be in verse 11. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. It says, For the grace of God, and here it is, this is God, the, what does God's grace do? According to this verse, it says, That brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, in the present age. Wow. Did you guys catch that? Did you guys get the full extent there? His grace teaches us all of these things to live godly. How, what's, who's, what, what's, what's, what's it saying here? We, we can't do any of these things in our own strength, in our own might, in our own power. It has to come from His grace to teach us to get out of these areas, to look at these areas and be disgusted and oh, the bible says abhor what is evil right meaning blah right like ah oh, it's, oh, it's disgusting i'm out of here the hate it with the hatred how can you do this who's going to instruct you and teach you these qualities of the word of god his grace teaches you these things it's a natural you guys get the natural byproduct thing now it just happens naturally when you came to christ and you have His grace, but these, this, these kind of things that the Bible is, explains is grace for your everyday life, obviously, right? His grace is able to keep you from evil. So, and give you that strength. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, we know that the, 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 here's the, the secret recipe to grace. You guys know all those great qualities about grace and what it does for us, right? We're able to stand, we're able to be bold, we're able to, right, do all this great stuff. But the only way you can access the grace of God, right, is by humbling yourself. You cannot access God's grace if you are proud. If you are, God, give me grace right now. Hurry it up. Come on. Let's go. Right? No. Eh. I'm going to go and do accomplish great things for you, God, because uh, hurry up. Give me that grace. Prideful hearts will never receive the grace. The Bible is very clear. In fact, this verse is throughout a couple other passages in the Bible. But God resists the proud, the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. The only way we can do that is by humbling ourselves. So we got to get into the mentality of, of saying, I, I, not I can, but I can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that delights God's heart. Every time we're like, I can't, <laughs> it's a good thing. That's kind of the sixth reason, and these ones, are, they just sum up really fast. Um, the sixth reason Paul was thankful is because Christ saved him. Go back to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, look at verse 15. It says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world for what? To save sinners. And Paul says, Of whom I am chief. Right? Why did Jesus Christ come into this world? It was to save sinners like you and I. Right? That, that's the key verse, by the way, in the book of Luke, in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. According to John 3, 17, the Bible says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You guys kind of get the purpose of why He came? It was to, for us, sinners, right? We were born in sin. David understood that, right? Psalm 51 don't stop praying for those in your life, by the way, for your family members, for those around you. Um, there's God can work in crazy ways. Do you guys know people in your life that are, you're like, I don't know, if that, I can never picture that person getting saved and yeah. turning from their lifestyle. I'm pretty sure we all can, right? But there's, what I love to hear is people who have, they, they didn't pray, I know, uh, I heard of some guy, he, 
He prayed for his brother for 60 straight years mm. until his brother was on the deathbed and he was in tears, repenting of his sin and turning to the Lord. And he received salvation at his deathbed. Mm. And it took all that long, but he said, every day I prayed for him, for his salvation. And God was faithful literally to the very end <laughs> in his life in that sense. But it's amazing. Um, Go back to the, the, the first Timothy. Look at the seventh reason that Paul was thankful. It's because Christ was a pattern for him. Look at verse 16. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy, Paul says, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. If Christ can save Paul, if Christ can save me and you, I'm pretty sure Christ can save others right other people that you're like no they're terrorists come on he's no he can't yes he can guess what's happening right now people are receiving dreams of jesus right and i'm talking about those who are the muslim faith and they're they're just like that they're they're finding christ salvation already god's they find the bible and god's instructing them and teaching them and they're growing just like that it just took a dream Isn't that crazy it's a lot of testimonies you can YouTube it. It's all over the place. But according to 2 Peter 3, 9, the Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What does that mean? That means God only came for the elect. Mm -mm. Yeah, it does. <laughs> God only came for a few people, right? No. Psst. That means... God, what is what does the end of the verse say? But that all should come to repentance. All I'm here to tell you that it doesn't really. I'm just joking. <laughs> all means all. all, but in the Greek, ah, all means all. all thank you. <laughs> so God really did come that all might re would repent. He, that's His heart. He wants everybody to repent, and every single person, every single soul in this entire world. To be in the kingdom of God with him. That's his true desire. It's crazy. But look at the eighth reason that Paul, Paul was thankful because Christ is worshipped. Look at verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul begins to worship the Lord after all of this stuff that he just realized, right, alone, he's just like, blah, right? He just wants to worship the Lord. God gave, gave us grace. He, he saved me from the person I used to be. God's been doing this. He put me into the ministry. He, right, he's, he's doing, remember, this is a contrast from the false teachers to the true teachers. Looking at the way he could have been, and now the way he is, because of Christ coming into his life, and now he's just like, man, to God who alone is eternal, to God alone, right? He's loving Jesus here. We, we see worship right here in, in Paul. And when we realize that Christ saved us, man, we can't help but to worship the Lord, right? Not just in song, but in studying the Word of God, in fellowshipping with other believers, in praying with each other. And there's all kinds of different areas that we can serve and worship the Lord. And by the way, did you guys know that worshiping God is a sacrifice? It's always been a sacrifice in the Old Testament. When you worship the Lord, it, there needs to be a sacrifice. In other words, man, my, I'm really just being torn. Uh, I really want to go and do this, but I know it's wrong. But it's so good. I really want it. But, uh, but I have an option to serve God instead. Ah, I'm going to choose the Lord. That's worship, right? That's sacrifice. When somebody comes to you and they're like, ah, you, ah, and you just want to punch them in the face, and you're like, no, I'm going to show them the love of Christ. You just worship the Lord. Isn't that crazy? Take advantage of those opportunities, by the way, when, when you know, you really want to walk in the flesh, but instead you choose to walk in the Spirit. You're going to be worshiping the Lord. It's not just when the songs come on. You guys get that? So, worship's always a sacrifice. Remember, by the way, before we end, don't be coming to church thinking, oh, I really, I really want to get a great teaching. I really want to get instructed by God. I really want to really just be just blown away at when, when I come to church and then leave just so like, woohoo, and skipping and dancing and yeah, I want to I wanna go. I really hope that they have this for lunch. 
at church. I really, I want to get some, you guys get the point? Don't go to church to get, but go to church to give. Give your heart to the Lord. Give in service. Give in worship. Give in prayer. Give, give, give. And what's naturally going to happen? You're going to receive naturally with that heart attitude. But if you have the heart attitude of, I'm going to go for myself, and I'm going to go to get, 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 then chances are, and I'm talking about great chances, you're going to be disappointed. Oh, 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 the teaching was not short. It was long. Just joking. Ah. But you guys get what I'm saying? Don't, don't go to church to go. You're never supposed to be in all that getting attitude. Always, throughout your life, be a giver, right? Be a servant. Go to give, and you'll always be blessed with that. So let's pray, and then we'll open up afterward for if you guys have any questions or you guys want to clarify or just go over. We'll go over it right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Jesus, that you have saved our lives, that you have come into our lives and shown us, Lord, uh, the blinders are just off, Lord. Now we can see the light. We can see around us. We can see the truth. And Lord, we don't have to live according to nonsense anymore, according to the find the power within your own heart stuff. But Lord, we can find you. We found you. And, and we just ask, Lord, that you would continue to grant us the grace that we need for today, Lord, through all the things that we're going to go through today after church, that you would just enable us, Lord, Enable us for the ministry that you've given us. Uh, Lord, continue to just do a mighty work within our hearts, Lord, that we would be your servants, Lord, who choose to glorify you and not choose to glorify our flesh and glorify our pleasures and our ways, Lord, but recognize that you're the truth, you're the life, and there is no other way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.